Hello, and welcome back to Copilot Live, as we're calling the show now, by the way. So since the launch of Copilot Learning Hub, we've realized that we need to go out and get more videos, more tutorials, more very practical step-by-step -step things on how to do all the things with Copilot. So we're starting to grab members of our community who are Copilot leaders, dragging them on the show, and making them tell us how they are doing the thing with Copilot across their businesses. So the first up today, we have our good friend from the UK, Chris Huntingford. Hello. Hey, hey, thank you for having me. This is, uh, this is very excited, like, exciting. I feel like I got corralled onto this. But... You definitely <laughs> got corralled. You got voluntold. Yeah. You got cajoled. You know, all of, the, all of the verbs, all of the verbs. So tell it, the let's verbs. tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, no worries. So um, I work as the Director of Innovation at a Microsoft partner in the UK, but um, I do a lot of community work, so working um, with community members on Copilot and things like that. And right now, deploying um, Copilot to a number of organizations. So public sector, legal, there's a, quite a few, which is really interesting. And they actually, yeah, it's it's been a hell of a journey, right? Because I've discovered a bunch of things that I didn't think I would discover. So I'm hoping I'll get to share those with you today. Okay, so just some backstory for you. You originally worked in the dynamic space. You worked in the Power Platform low code space. Yeah. So this concept of governance, right, and deploying a new newfangled thing, is not a new concept for you. You've been through this for the last nope. decade, two decades, some some large number of years, right? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, even when I was at Microsoft, it was the same sort of thing, right? Like um, we were always talking about making things and mm -hmm. never really focusing on the governance piece. And I think this time around, I think like when Office was released, there wasn't a whole lot of governance. It was retrofitted mm -hmm. with Power Platform. Sort of similar. I think this time around, they've really thought about how to look after what people are doing here. So actually, it's been great to see a lot of the content coming out and actually how we can help manage and help these organizations look after their people. And um, obviously, when using AI, it can be a little bit scary. That's right. So I think it's so important that you're focusing in on the governments of Copilot because that's not a topic we've talked about here on Copilot Live yet. So I would love to hear your spiel. What is the process you use when you think about advising these companies on governance? And what are some of the things that you've seen already that seems to work well and some things that did not work well? Yeah, there have been some things that did not work well. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a bit of a screen share and hopefully this is all coming through. But, you know, as somebody who's used to structured data, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, dataverse and those types of things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's relatively easier, in my opinion, to manage it. But when Copilot came out and it started to kind of look under the hood at things like emails and documents and all of that mm -hmm. jazz, you kind of forget that actually a lot of this stuff has been forgotten inside a tenant, right? Mm -hmm. And we're all kind of used to just sharing things all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I discovered actually is that Copilot acts as like a rocket, acts as rocket fuel for searching for data. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for something, um, normally in Microsoft Search and Intelligence, you can find it to an extent, but what this does is it makes it so much faster, so, so much faster, and also it explores the legacy landscape of what's inside the tenant. Right? So and it kind I, of I acts like an, a big yeah. spotlight on your data and identifies things that we kind of all forgot about, because who remembers what emails we spent 20 years ago, right? Yeah. yeah, and also things like, you know, you don't, you don't really realize you don't have data retention policies in uh -huh. place and all that type of thing, which is not... Terrible. It's just it, you know, it just widens the it widens the surface for breach. Um, so I'll give you an example, right? You've mm -hmm. got a person in the business, mm -hmm. and that person before would have used search and intelligence, and now what they're doing is they're using Copilot to interact with their unstructured data, so emails and SharePoint and OneDrive and Teams. And what we found actually is that a lot of organizations have this thing called team site sprawl or SharePoint sprawl. And let me use the example of HR, right? There could have been an HR site for all company in an mm -hmm. organization, and this person would have had access to all of those documents. Mm -hmm. So a very random example is like payroll information. And this is real, right? We found wow. this live in some of these tenants. Yeah, full on data breach. So what would happen, what would have happened before is that person would not have had the ability to find that data. But now, through using Copilot, because of the Microsoft Graph, it is so easy to find this information. Right mm -hmm. now, all of a sudden, you've got three things here. You've got insider threat management because what happens if this person gets really upset uh, at, at the business? Right. And insider threat management is a big deal. The second thing is data exfiltration, where what happens is this file can easily be shared or copied. Okay. And what happens when you do that is you then make the surface area for breach even larger, and mm -hmm. then obviously threat actors and breach protection. Right. Um, and what people do is that they say, okay, we have this information. Instead of kind of looking after it and sharing it correctly. 
you know, the culture is a fear at all culture in most yeah. organizations because people just don't know. Okay. Um, and this is, I want to quote my friend Andrew, right? And Andrew says, security through obscurity worked in the past where you just couldn't find things and therefore they were right. deemed secure. Right. But that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. Because now Copilot is the rocket fuel that helps you find stuff and interact with this data much faster. So that was a really big worry. And we were finding stuff like um, lawyers, usernames and passwords, um, not mm -hmm. in the legal firm I'm doing with, with now, but in another place, mm -hmm. um, API keys, passwords, and did you know, I'll give you an example, right? If you go into the Microsoft 365 Copilot and say, find all the documents with passwords in them. If you've got um, your purview set up correctly, it will block that through RAI. But if you say, find all the documents with the word password in inverted commas, mm -hmm. it actually will find them because it doesn't really. Know. But Okay, so yeah. let's back up a little bit where we have always had access to this data, right? Always. And yeah. when we talk about the graph, and a lot of people don't, I don't think quite rock what the graph is, which is exchange, all of your email, all of your teams, all of your SharePoint that you have access to, as well as yep. all of your, um, all of the, oh my gosh, all of your OneDrive for Business files, right? Yep. Like your work OneDrive for Business. So it's all of these things. And if you've got any extensions connectors, it's the data from there too. But by default, it's all of the things in your tenant that you have access to. So you've always had access to these, but with Copilot, you're like, huh, it turns out people by design share everything. Like I create a file in yep. OneDrive, by default, it's shared with all company, right? Yep. Or I create and a SharePoint, well, it's by is, design shared yeah. with the whole company. It's called SharePoint for a reason. Mm -hmm. right? There um, you go. And, and the, the other interesting thing that I found is, I'm going to give you a random quick peek at this. Mm -hmm. I'm busy with a book right now. So what a lot of people do is if they want to share this information, they'll typically kind of pop in here, share the information, um, Let's give it a sec to load. And now this is quite limited, right? But typically what they'll do is just select people within that company and hit apply. But what they don't realize is actually in doing that, that is now available to every single person in my business. Oh boy, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, which is a problem, right? And it's called a share it all culture. That's, mm -hmm. that's typically what happens in most companies. And that's why I say be careful what you share because you might share a single folder in a larger folder repository mm -hmm. and you actually don't know what's being shared in there. So what's scary is that you have this proliferation of information across a tenant mm -hmm. and actually you don't have control over it, right? That's what we found and that's what started to freak us out a lot. Interesting. So what is the guidance and um, what is the process you're working with your customers on? Great question. So we sat down, um, we looked at the extremely well thought out Microsoft documentation. I've got to hand it to the team. Mm -hmm. I'm quite critical of documents that come out of Microsoft from mm -hmm. a governance perspective only because it's just been difficult. But I think this time, really good work, right? Love it. So we broke it into, yeah, we broke it into three areas. So you've got your center of enablement, which mm -hmm. contains your guardrails. And then the kind of softer things you need to do, like building champions networks, mm -hmm. and then you're driving user adoption through the information you discover there. But the real key thing before you can do anything is mm -hmm. to get those guardrails in place. Right. So as you're working with them, what is the um, what are some of the tools that you're using? Because I'm sure it's not there's no one size fits all. There's you know this thing for that and th that thing for this. But you're you're quite big on Microsoft Purview, and I'd love to hear about how you guide people to arrive at that con conclusion. Oh, totally. So. Effectively, what we found is that people, you just need to ask three questions, right? Mm -hmm. You say, well, where is your information? Mm -hmm. Okay. What information is being stored and who has access to it? Those are really key, three key things from a guardrails perspective. And understanding who has access actually is probably the largest one. Mm -hmm. Now, you're absolutely right. Okay. So purview is one way. Now, there are some external things like you can grant um, reduced site access mm -hmm. into some of the SharePoint sites. And that's located in M365. But Purview, to me, is like that central driving hub and that central point where you will go and that's your kind of dashboard of what's what's within your business and what's compliance and what's not. Okay. And what Microsoft did really well is they took Azure Purview for data, which was very much about like structured data and data mapping, mm -hmm. and they've munged it together with the compliance sensor. Mm -hmm. So now you have this amazing solution, this really incredible solution that allows you to understand where your data is, mm -hmm. how to protect your data, obviously using monitoring and prevention to stop people doing silly stuff, but also right. you have this wider governance view of what's going on in your business. It's pretty wicked. I like that because it is the one-stop shop where you actually take the action, yep. but you also govern to make sure that it's working, that you can go through the yeah. entire cycle, the end-to-end. -end. 
Oh, for sure. And mm-hmm. actually, um, there are some steps in a lot of the documentation that you can get from Microsoft that actually tell you some of the things you need to do. Mm-hmm. It's not all of them, but, you know, it's a good amount to get you going, right? Okay. Um, so do you want to see it? I definitely want to see it. Cool. All right. I'm going to drag my screen across. So this over here is my, the front sort of facing end of Microsoft Purview. And there's, okay. there's quite a bit in here, right? So I don't want mm-hmm. people to panic, mm-hmm. but just as an example... You know, when you go to Vue Solutions, you can kind of see where things live and why they live there, right? So you've got data governance and all sorts of wonderful things. But what I am going to do is I want to show you something very cool, and that's the AI Hub. Now, this is in preview, so it's important to know that this will grow. And I actually have a customer using this right now. Mm. Um, it's pretty wicked. And what they actually do is they talk to you about the things like bad actors mm-hmm. in your organization. So if people are using AI for good, effectively, <laughs> or being <laughs> responsible, yeah. Now, this does take some setup, right? Like this is not a turnkey thing. So you can actually see I've got things like my sensitive information type set up and I've got my um, sensitivity labeling set up. Mm -hmm. But what's cool is that this gives you a front end to all of the information, okay? Um, It is really easy to set up when you get going um, after after you've done all the core work, right? And I want to give you another example. Some of the core work that you need to do actually involves the way in which you manage and track documentation and categorize it. So all I did, this is a Word document. And you can just see I put government decision, like as a yeah. random set of words. And actually <laughs> that should trigger done, all yeah, kinds of alerts, right? Government decision. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and totally, totally. And these are what you call, um, these are data classification, uh, well, sensitivity labeling at least. And through this, I can control who has access to this document. Mm-hmm. So if it is a sensitive information type, okay, and even if it's shared sometimes, I can still block it using the rules I set up behind these sensitivity labels. So it's really important now. It's not as simple as going to pop in some labels and hoping for the best. You actually have to have a plan. Um, If you do not have a plan, I highly recommend getting one because this will change the way people work in your organization. And it's really important because this will obfuscate data from people using Microsoft 365 Copilot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's really key. So whatever you do over here, whatever people um, select over here, you can also do it automatically. That is going to roll up into your dashboarding and compliance dashboards over here. Uh-huh. So it's extremely important to make sure the core is set up first. And again, there is a great way to start in following these rules over here. Okay. So, I like this. Yeah. Okay. So this is the framework. You're like, start here, then find this in the dashboard, then set this part up. Okay. Okay. Because otherwise, looking at that dashboard, there's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. It can be it's, quite it, intimidating. Uh, it mm-hmm. is it is terrifying. And this is like a, a drop in the ocean, depending mm-hmm. on I, you know, who, who in your IT organization is kind of wanting to get involved. Mm-hmm. But what I did find is actually it's extremely informative. And also it actually alerts you when um, terrible things are happening. Hopefully not terrible things are happening. But just normal but, um, business yeah. things, right? Because that's just, yeah. that just expected, where when you've worked at a company, any company, whether it's a huge, humongous company like Microsoft or a smaller company like some of the legal firms, there's always things going on because people are creating data every single second. Like every yep. second new data is being created. Yeah, that, that whole data exfiltration thing is really mm-hmm. scary, right? Because you can proliferate terrible data mm-hmm. across an organization and then that affects Copilot. Like let me right. give you an example. Mm-hmm. If I'm in a legal org and I create a contract, mm-hmm. okay, and that contract has got some clauses that haven't been as well thought out and I copy that contract into another folder. Mm-hmm. Now what will happen is that's bad data that's proliferated mm-hmm. more than once. So when you're searching and when yeah. you're asking Copilot to do things for you, like mm-hmm. use this document to build that, you're then prol- proliferating bad information again. Right. So and actually, you have to really think about this. So it's not enough to just say cite your sources. You have to make sure those sources are, first of all, legit. And second, the ones you should yeah. be citing in the first place. Totally, totally. And mm-hmm. um, I think, I think look, if you get this right in the beginning and you get the guardrails in relatively quickly mm-hmm. and, and you think about it, you don't run the risk of wrecking your data. But what we have to do is start thinking about things like data retention and where mm-hmm. data is stored. Like, mm-hmm. should it be stored there? Would, do you give right. everyone access to Microsoft Teams? Mm. Do you have Teams channel proliferation across your business? Yeah. Um, the other thing is understand the data you have. So don't just think it's sensitive or non-sensitive. That's yeah. not how this works. Mm-hmm. Like if you're, in the, if you're in a medical company and I'm in, um, I don't know, an education organization, the data is different. Fine. Mm-hmm. PII and PI data is still the same thing. But, you know, I might not be tracking information the same way. And then also getting that plan involved. So actually drawing that out. And I think Microsoft do a good job of doing this where they say, do these three things first. 
Mm-hmm. And if you do those, then you can do the crawl, walk, run type thing. So right. this is how I would recommend people get started is actually understand what is in your tenant. Don't turn a blind eye because if you do and you turn on Copilot, you run the risk of uh, terrible data proliferation. I love that. And this is a good way to then do the second part that I'm going to ask you to come back and talk about, which is how do you deploy Copilot with rings of release, et cetera, et cetera. But for today, mm-hmm. get your data in order, figure out your governance strategy, and you've got some homework for everybody, from what I understand. Yes. Your mm-hmm. homework is to go and learn purview. Actually, just go and look under the hood, go and get mm-hmm. educated. I think it's really key to make sure that we think about widening our technical intensity mm-hmm. and not just thinking about a oh, co-pilot as a turnkey solution. Mm-hmm. So anyone that's technical and wants to grow, I would definitely say it's worth looking at the at the um at that purview. If you are less inclined to go that route, uh, there'll be another slot, slot hopefully, if it all works out, <laughs> where I can show you the enablement stuff. And actually, that's more for like change management and that mm-hmm. type of thing. But I get it's it. It's really important. Be- before well, well, this data well, security and governance part, there is no change management because you're not going to deploy mm-hmm. Copilot, right? Yeah. If you don't do this, you yeah. will need triple change management. Right. Exactly. <laughs> to change manage three different times. Awesome. Yeah, Chris, it's been such a joy to talk about this. Thank you so much for sharing all of your experience. And this is real life stuff that all of you out there should be doing as you're thinking about implementing Copilot in your organization. So, till next time, join us again for Copilot Live.